And the reason we did that is because we don't want to look at options that we can't use. That's information that's not useful to us. So this is what I'm talking about in terms of phrasing the question. The way you phrase the question, if you have Galapagos looking at possible variations of this, you know, incredibly skinny triangles that you'll never fit a program into, that's not useful to you. That's just a lot of extra. So if you can avoid doing that, uh, it makes for a more useful optimization. The other thing that we're starting to use Galapagos for, uh, and this, this has been really, really awesome, I mean, very effective with people that are business-minded people, not necessarily architects, but, um, is we can weight our results. So in the past, we've taken, say, two different design options. We've done the solar radiation on both, and we said option C is 20% better than option B. So isn't that great? But it always leaves a question in people's mind, like 20% better compared to what? You know, there's no there's no scale there, right? But now you can create a scale because you have you can run 2,000 variations and have them run as an optimized system, right? So now we can say, you know, option A ranks in the 50th percentile of all possible options. Option B ranks in the 40th percentile. Option C, so on and so forth. Now you've created a value system that then people can make informed decisions based on. Uh, so that's that's one of the things we're using these uh, Galapagos runs for. Uh, the other thing is we're always looking for new drivers, new things to inform design. Uh, this one is, uh, this is an office building in uh, Boston. It's in the Seaport area, familiar with Boston. Uh, and it's something where the developer came to us and said, I can sell office space with views for more than I can sell office space with traffic views. Uh, so that's valuable to me. Uh, so we said, okay, fine. You tell us, where are the good views? Where are the million dollar views? They said, they're over here. So we built a giant cylinder in the model, and we ranked those views at a certain level. Uh, then we have a cylinder over here, and these are the kind of like most valuable views. And we just ran vectors out to those points to see how many times you can visually connect to those views from all the given points on the floor plate. Um, we also, if you cross the building, we can do some uh, and then and that was also based on distance. So we started to kind of factor in all this different stuff. Like, uh, if there's a building right next door, that's negative. If there's a building that's like 100 feet away, that's still kind of an awesome view. Uh, so there's a lot of value judgment in all of this, but uh, I mean, you do the best you can. The more, uh, the more interesting you make it, the, the, more, the better the information is. So uh, that is the configuration that gives them floor plate that is optimized for use. So, uh, you know, it's not like we're going to make that the building, uh, but we know that, now you see the trend, right? It's about, it's all about this long facade that's looking uh, through this gap between this taller building here and, and across the bay. So, um, you might have thought of that intuitively, but definitely having something like this kind of confirms it. Um, and in situations that are more complex, where you have you know, another kind of urban scenario where you might have buildings all over the place. Definitely until like this starts to inform your design thinking. So, um, the other thing that we're doing a lot of is working with data. Um, we're always trying to figure out ways of incorporating numbers uh, into the visuals so that uh, we're working with metrics because that changed. Um, because metrics communicate with a certain group of people. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to do a solar, we're going to do solar optimization. I'm going to run you through how I do it, how I set Diva, um, how we produce these metrics, and basically how we communicate them to someone who does it. So what that's going to look like at the end is this video here. It allows to give you the closest thing to a square that it would give you. 
because a square limits the surface area ratio. So you get the smallest amount of surface area, the floor area, with the square. If you let it have five sides, it'll take it. If you let it have six sides, it'll take it because surface area will always dominate the calculation. It's always the most dominant factor. Um, knowing that, I sort of realized, like, you know, I don't really care about the surface area so much. What I really want to know is, like, maybe I want to know a combination of where on the side it should go, um, and I don't, I don't want it to always be a box. Uh, so this one actually can move around the site, uh, and you can see that it's going to start to make its way up into this corner here where it gets some shade from the neighboring building. Um, so the point I'm making is just that the more information you give it, the better answer you get. If you ask it a stupid question, it gives you a stupid answer. Um, so don't expect it to like, I mean, this is always the thing. Uh, it's really funny. When, I, when we show this to people that don't use these tools, they have always, without fail, they say, I could have told you that. <laughs> because we show them a proof of concept. It's always like a simple thing. It's just, you know, it's like the umbrella thing. And then they go, duh. But that's not the point. The point is, when things get complex, when we start to enter all the information in, uh, that's when we get answers that we could have never predicted. Okay, I'm gonna yes. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah. If you would, if you want the numbers to print out at the bottom, you saw the areas and stuff. That's all that the yeah, human is doing. Like um, it's just a really good way of printing the numbers. Like that's what I found so far. Um, everything else will run just by the top. Uh, so Eva, Grasshopper, and you don't need much box or anything like that. Um, so should be good. Okay, so. As soon as you open the script, you'll see that yeah, everything gets created. Um, one thing I kind of messed up was I saved the file after the, the uh, optimization. So you are looking at it in its optimized phase. So if you run Galapagos on this file, it won't change. It's going to be, it's just going to stay like that. because it's already, So tweak the numbers before you start, start doing the run. Otherwise, it's really no fun. Um, Okay, so let me, let me break this down for you guys. Uh, first thing, just a general overview of how this works. This stuff right here, all it's doing is creating two curves. And a lot. Does everyone see them? Copy them out of there? The green? Okay, so it's the same exact set of components. Um, I use this method for one reason. Um, you fix the floor plate area. Um, so generally what you know at the beginning of the project is the floor area. It's like the one that you start off with. Um, not always, but most of the time someone says, I want a building and I want to do this area. So you kind of know what the floor plate is. Sometimes you know what the site is, so you know that you can't have a building that's long and skinny, or you can't have a building that's square, or whatever. But a lot of times you don't even know that. So the only given, the only constant in this, in this is that it's 30,000 square foot of floor plate, which you can adjust. So whatever your building floor plate is, just fill that number in there, and it will always produce a shape that is 30,000 square feet. Uh, the way it does that is it uses uh, draws a length, one side, and that's this value right here.
the right list because this is actually one of the most important parts because it's how you ask the question, right? It's the way that it's allowed to test stuff. Um, so this is insanely simple. Um, trust me. It is. Uh, it's just a box. It's just a box. It's just, it's just saying, okay, draw a point in the x. Not relevant. 
because it's just the part that makes the floor slabs and the glass, and you can do that a hundred different ways, and you're welcome to use my way. Uh, I make this component. Uh, everyone I know that uses a lot of Grasshopper has their own version of this component. Um, It's not a component, it's a cluster. Uh, do you guys, do you guys use clusters? Everybody? Anybody? Okay. Uh, so for people who don't know what clusters are, uh, it's a grasshopper script inside of a grasshopper script. A nested script. Alright, so in here is a whole bunch of stuff. It's long. Um, I try to make it as unbreakable as possible. Um, it does a pretty good job. Uh, you can still break it, it's not perfect. It's a work in progress. Um, it, it'll do like pretty, pretty uh, far out shapes and stick uh, stick together, but um, you know, it has some weaknesses too. So you know, it's, not the, it's not the best, but it's getting better. So it, it's mass based. You feed in a mass, a mesh or a B rep, uh, and then you give it four to floor heights. So you set those in a list. Um, However you want to make that list. So for this, I go <clears throat> So I just did a list that's 18, 18, 18. Uh, the reason I do this is because four to heights are always random, of course. You know, like in practice, you, you can do this whole 18, 18, 18 thing, and always the first floor is like 20. And the second floor is like 18 plus 6, and the third floor. And so, like, you end up writing this giant script, but you just type in the numbers. It's the fastest way to do it. Just type in the list of your four to four heights. It's, uh, it's the best. So, um, here I didn't do it because I was just lazy. I didn't want to type 18, 13 times, but um, I just type in the lists here. Ceiling heights is where the ceiling goes, and it's not really necessary for this, but um, I, I use it for the, like, where the spandrel is. Um, okay, so that takes care of those two things. Um, this will produce a core if you want to, if you don't need it to. Uh, you can put a core outline in there, or you can just tell it to offset from the surface of the building. So, um, you can just mess with a couple of those parameters and you can see what it's doing. Uh, first, we're going to turn off some of this stuff. So it produces a skin, which is a panelized version of the shape that you gave it. And you set the module right there. So I set the 10 feet, which is probably double like what you want it to be. Um, but it makes it for a faster calculation, so I'm using 10 right now. Um, so if your glass panel was 10 feet big, it would look like this. And, um, sorry, turn this off. There it is. Okay. Uh, and so, so for example, if I was to change this to 20, you would get a glass module of 20. And it's not exactly 20, it's like the closest it can get, given the length of the sides. It takes an hour. Um, that is like one of the big problems with it right now, is that uh, the variation of panel size, because when you're doing a building, you don't want glass that's like 2 feet wide at the bottom and 4 feet wide at the top or whatever, so um, that's what I'm going to show you. But, it simple, so. Um, so rather than going through every single one of these, I'm just going to go through the ones that we use for this analysis. For this analysis, we need to know where the glass is. That's where the heat gate's coming in, right? Um, we don't care about the whole building because the building is insulated, and we only care about the uninsulated parts of the building. Those are the holes where the heat gate's in. So uh, every solar radiation I've ever seen always the whole building. It never does the span well. And that's fine if you're doing comparative analysis. But uh, if you are getting into details, uh, 
definitely that's something you want to model because the, your entire exterior building can't be glass. Uh, even if it is glass, visually behind that glass, and at least 60% of the building is insulated in panel of some kind, uh, prescriptively by code. Uh, so anyway, uh, that is why I have division panel, which you see here, and I divide it up and then that's vandal panel, which you see there. And also the curve. So this thing will automatically generate this. All it needs is the mass, and you set the floor to floor heights, and it'll make this shape for us. Um, and like I said, we're not going to—we're not doing a grasshopper, a general grasshopper thing. So I'm not going to show you how I did all this stuff. But it wasn't—I didn't do any magic. It was pretty straightforward stuff, um, except for this, you know, this one. There's some magic <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> So what we need for analysis is floors, uh, because they'll cast shadow. Uh, we'll need roofs, because they will cast shadow. And they will bounce light. And that's important. So if we get little roofs here, they're going to actually bounce light up onto this glass. So D would be calculate the bounce light, and we want it to. That's the kind of information we want to know. Uh, and that's the kind of information we didn't have before. Uh, so we'll do that. Keep the floor there, the roof there. Uh, ceiling we don't really need, and the floor we don't need. So essentially what we have is slab ceilings uh, and two types of exterior skin. We've got vision and spandrel. Okay? Okay. Um, so let's do the demon part of this. Should I do it from scratch? How much time do we have? How much time do we have? You can leave for the airport at 5.30. 5.30? Absolutely. 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 So really, let's say we have until five. Until five. All right. Let's do it from scratch. Okay. It's just this part. No one can. Okay. And by the way, all this right here is the, is the chart. Um, I've packaged it. Mm -hmm. So that thing sits at a chart, and um, what you need for that is, like I said, the three things. Um, we need the radiation on each panel, we need the area of each panel, and we need the vector data of each panel. I have some sample stuff in there. Just so that you know, you have something to start with, and then you can funnel in your results instead of these. But uh, just so you know, this thing isn't broken when you look at that. There it is. Alright, so we don't have to worry about that now. And we are going to. Uh, 
like what happens here and what happens in every single space. When there's too much daylight, people lower the shade. And it's natural human behavior to keep them down. Um, so what you really want to measure is usable daylight, which is the daylight that's between 300 and 2,000 lux. Uh, so that, that above 2,000 is basically assumed to be glare. That's the part that's important. That's the part that makes this whole thing useful. Uh, okay, so Diva is DaySim's Rhino version. So it's a front end of a front end of a front end for Rhino. Um, and it's, it's basically uh, going to tell us things like solar radiation, uh, daylight, energy, all of this kind of uh, data-driven analysis kind of things it does for us. Uh, if, you, if you did install Diva or you have installed it before, you'll know that it installs like eight programs on your computer because it's using eight different programs as it's doing its calculations. Um, it's a wonderful, awesome tool uh, that I'm just like get totally nerdy about. Um, okay, so uh, here's our Diva toolbar, and the first thing we need to do is to define materials. Uh, I've seen people not do this step, and that horrifies me. Um, because without this, you can't cast shadows. So you need the material component right here. Because you need to define all what is in your file that's solid as a wall, the stuff that's glass, the stuff that is going to bounce light, and how much it's going to reflect light. And unless you do that, Diva is useless. It's not going to tell you anything you don't know. So first thing, let's take vision. That's our vision glass. Put it in the material. and. Right here, we'll just say that that is uh, glazing, low E, um, double thing there. Yeah, E, 65, that's good. That's a good one. That's a good realistic one. Okay, and these, um, you should mesh your surfaces uh, because, like almost every single analysis tool that I can think of, they use meshes to do the analysis. Um, so. Your surfaces are being converted to a mesh in this component, just so you know. Uh, I've seen it break sometimes, and if it breaks, it's because it's not converting correctly, so mesh it first, then let it the component. Also, check your normals. Normals is something that, like, that will just totally screw up your calculation. So if your normals are pointing in the wrong direction, um, you'll, get, you'll get the wrong results. So you have to make sure your surfaces are pointed out to the outside, or the sun doesn't see them. Okay, the next thing is uh, spandrel, which we are just, I think, for spandrel, I just call it outside the side. There isn't like a exterior panel material. And I'm not sure about adding more materials to this. Anyone know? Okay, I haven't seen anyone that been able to add materials to this. I mean, in, the, like, full, in the version in Rhino, you can find materials, but in here, I haven't seen anyone do it. So, not sure what's going on with that. Uh, outside the side looks fine, though. That's all we care about is that it's not letting light in, and it's bouncing light. Okay, next thing, roof. Um, so, roof is, is there, there's ceiling, uh, and that's the daylighting, by the way. That's the bounce light, so we're not doing daylighting, so we don't care. I think we're going to use outside facade again. It's not interior wall, generic floor, we'll do next. Let's see outside facade. Okay. Um, then we got floor, and that would just do a generic floor, 20. Okay, so we got our objects. We need one more thing. Uh, you always got to have a ground plane, uh, because a ton of light bounces off the ground and back up onto your building, so make sure you have a ground plane. Uh, I don't have a site in this file, but a site is great to have. I mean, you get so much more, and the information is so much richer when you're putting site geometry, and when you do that, you're going to use the exterior building material again on that. So I just kept this around. I don't want to remake it. It's, a, it's just a plane. See it down there? It's just to bounce light back up onto the building, which, which it would. So uh, for that, I'm going to give that a uh, no, outside ground. Okay, so that's my outside ground. Okay, sweet. So we've got our objects. Now let's do our diva. Uh, there's like the main diva component. Is that it? Yeah. 
even daylight analysis. Okay, so project name, that's optional. Let's just say yes. Um, somewhere, I never use it, but somewhere Diva saves all of your runs in like a text file. And it names them with this name that you give it. That's the best one. Uh, okay, geometry. So this is where all this stuff goes in. It all goes in here. And we just stick in all of it in the same place. So you're just feeding geometry into the radiance uh, ray tracing engine. Uh, and you do that for your site, everything, everything you wanted included in the calculation, you run it in the GM. Those are the things casting shadows. Okay, um, now we need nodes. Uh, and this is the most important part. You define in Diva where your sensors are. Think of them like you're placing little sensors somewhere in space, and those little sensors are going to generate data. Uh, so we need to create little sensors. Uh, the fastest and easiest way to do that is to go into our vision panel. Let's do simple mesh. Okay. So I've got the simple mesh, and I'm just going to do an area, which will give me the center point of every single panel. There it is. And I'm almost ready to use that for my sensor, but there's one really important thing I gotta do, and that is offset it from the surface by some little amount. If you don't offset it, the surface will cast a shadow on your node and it gets splotchy, spotty, crappy results. Um, and that's because it's so close to the surface that sometimes it's in and sometimes it's out. And that surface will actually shade the point. So just make sure you get it out and away from the surface. So for that, we'll do a normal, Base normal is from the mesh in there, so those are normal, and then we'll just move move our points by normal uh, and some amplitude. So we'll run our normal into the vector there, and then that into there. And then the amount of the offset goes right here, which I'm going to say for now is just, oh, uh, let's say it's point five. And if it's something you don't plan on changing, I try and use those sliders. Just, I just type in a little box. So, um, okay, so what that did right there is just took every point and offset it by its normal point five. There, okay. Compared to there, no. Compared to someone on. Okay. So I moved it by its normal point five feet. <laughs> like we're just spitting out the worst results and um, kind of figured it out. You know, so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, basically, it's like you're saying there's a canopy in front of your node that doesn't exist there because there's glass in front of it. So, and it's going to happen not every panel. It's only going to happen like sometimes. So you'll get splashiness. It'll cover your. It'll mess up your entire run. Um, so, and if that happens, that's the problem. Okay, so we've got our nodes. They're right. Uh, they're right here. They're the move ones. And we're going to run those right into nodes. Okay. Now we need the vectors. We already have those. Those are right here. The models. So it needs to know which direction the nodes are pointing or facing. I don't really know why, but I just, I don't know, I just work here. Um, <laughs> need a true, star, true false to kick this up. Need a true 
defaults to start this thing. That's it. So uh, that's that's the basic setup. Now you go in here and tell it what analysis you want to run. Um, so first of all, one of location, anchorage. Um, I'm afraid that Oregon is not in yet. You got Seattle? You got Seattle, okay. Okay. I think you can add to this list though. It's just a matter of, do you know you guys know where to get EPW files? You can click right there, no. Oh, <laughs> yeah, or the Department of Energy. You can go to their site if, you're, if this is too hard for you, like me. <laughs> it's, it's down there. And actually, there's international data too. So if you're working with a project that's uh, somewhere overseas, there's a lot of that information. Uh, the thing to know about that information is it usually comes from airports. So if you get a location and you're wondering if the data comes from near your site, look for the airport. That's probably where, it's, where it came from. Okay, um, solar radiation nodes. It's already it's already set up. Um, that's what we're looking for. Solar radiation nodes. If we want to do uh, daylight, uh, it's planet based. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So when you switch to this climate base, that's what you're going to use for your daylight simulation. We're not going to do that. I'm just telling you guys for the future if you want to get into doing your daylight analysis, do this climate base and then set this outputs. This will give you all of this stuff at the same time, but the one you really care about is the UDI. Uh, this one, 100 to 2000. Click that. Um, because that, that's the best information in terms of daylight. It's the stuff that's not too bright, and it's the stuff that's not too dim. Um, and that's based on time, by the way. So what it's telling you is what percentage of the time is the, are the natural daylight levels between those extremes on a, in, a, in a period of like a year. You tell it what period of time to look at. Okay, so, uh, usually it only goes during like office hours. I think that's a setup somewhere else. Um, and it, I think it it's, uh, assumes three feet, so like a work surface. So it's looking for, and actually no, you tell it the notes. You tell it what you want the notes to be. So scratch that. But you want to put them at the work surface. <laughs> uh, so that, that's like the, the right place to put them. Um, off, just some numbers off, uh, off the cuff. 300 is like I think your uh, amount for daylight autonomy in an office space. It's 300 to 500 lux. Uh, which just means you can turn the lights off. When 300 lux are hitting your work surface, the lights can be completely turned off. If it's between 100 and 300, they can be dim. Uh, and that is that first one, daylight autonomy. All that means, it sounds like really complex, it just means when is the light, when is it brighter than 300 lux? Which, if you think about it, it's, it's kind of useless because if you if you start doing these analysis, you find that by the glass, it's almost always good. It's like it's like the best news you've ever heard. It's like, oh wow, we don't need lights in the building. But the reality is, like, it's too bright. Most of the time, you're getting a ton of glare, and people sitting next to that glass are going to lower their shades, and then the situation is going to get much worse inside. So you want to know what the UDI is, the stuff that's in between the bright stuff and the Okay, we're not going there though. That was just a long um, sidetrack. We're going solar radiation nodes. We're going to run it for the whole year. Uh, a note here um, you don't want to run it for the whole year. You only want to run it for when the building's in cooling mode. I'm just being lazy right now, and I don't want to figure out when the building's in cooling mode. Um, but if you're at a site like um, Boston, let's say, let's say you're at a site like Los Angeles, right? The building's going to be in cooling mode most of the year, even during the winter, the building's in cooling mode. So then I actually care about heat gain. But what you don't want to do is worry about heat gain when the heater's on, because the heat gain's good. You want the building to get hotter, you're actually fighting yourself, right? So um, what you want to do if you want this to be meaningful is to figure out for your site when the building is going to be in cooling mode. That's when you care about blocking the sun. So uh, how do you do that? Uh, there is a free tool called Climate Consultant. Anyone mm -hmm. ever? Yeah, yeah. Schools love that one because it's you just like open it up and it's just like spitting charts out at you and you look like a scientist. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and it's like free and easy. So um, that one will tell you. It'll give you a, the um, it'll give you 
the, the uh, comfort zone of the end of the year. I'll give you that chart. You can basically figure out when the comfort zone drops below, when the temperature drops below the comfort zone, that's when you're cold um, and you don't care about heating. And when it's above there, then you care about the radiation. And that's the, those are the months that you want to run this analysis for. So um, let's just say I'm not, I can say custom and I can set it for, yeah, fine, let's do that. So it's March 31st out to October. So I went online, I looked at kind of consulting, and I found out that my building is in cooling mode between these months, and so I don't want to reduce that cooling mode. So this is what I care about. Um, that's pretty much it. You're ready to go after that solar radiation. We got the location from Seattle. Um, and then the radius parameters. Um, okay. These this is like a sampling of what I'm talking about with radius. The whole program is like this. See these little AB2, AB1000, AS20. They stand for like ambient bounces. And then I forget what the rest of them are. And the whole, you basically type that in, like pages and pages of that. And you type into your, your geometry like that. Um, I mean, you have to be insane to, to use that program. But anyway, um, these are the numbers that control the rendering quality. So uh, the first one is the one that I use. The rest of them, I don't even know what they mean. Um, it's, it's ambient bounces. So uh, two ambient bounces means it will bounce the light twice. And then the light that hits the node, it will collect that information. You'll find it's pretty slow. At least on my laptop, it's going to be pretty slow, so I'm going to turn it down to just one bounce. Um, for a, I read online that for like a good final result, I'm going to turn that number up to five. Uh, in our experience, the numbers change a lot between one. It goes up. You get a lot more heat that comes in off of a bounce, off of a roof or some other surface. Um, it goes up again with two quite a bit. After that, it falls off really fast. Like, the third bounce doesn't add much more heat. So, that helps you guys. So I'm going to turn it, just change this to one and say OK. And um, that's it. We are ready. So, you want to put your power cable because it looks like you're about to. Right. Oh, oh. Yeah. I mean, was, <laughs> oh yeah, it does actually. The fan goes on. I tested it like last night and it got super hot. So what I want to do is find the, of those numbers that I just showed you, 
I want to find the largest and the smallest one because I need to find the range. And I'm going to assign those the, the color strings, blue and red. Uh, so find the extremes. I need to go to uh, there, the main uh, balance. And see how my data is coming out here? It's not flattened. Um, so for those of you not yet cool with the data structure, um, all these are on a separate branch. So what, if I just run this straight into this right now, and it's just going to look at each one of these numbers individually. So 562 will both be the min and the max every single time. It's just going to run it however many pounds I have. Uh, so what I need to do is flatten the list. So just make sure you flatten. Um, and then run that in. And out come two numbers, the ones I want. 181 to 582. So the dimmest panel is 181, and the brightest panel is 582. And then I say, uh, deconstruct domain or something like that. Uh, deconstruct domain, yeah. There. So that's one of the numbers, 181, and that's 582, the other number. And now the ingredient, which represents those colors. And those become my stopping and endpoints. So I'll say that's the brightest, and that's the darkest. Color. And I switch this to this one, just easier to read. Um, last time I screwed this up, and I got these backwards. So I'm pretty sure this L0 corresponds with this out here. Unless I like, just double orange myself. So I think that's, that's how you do it. Um, okay, so now that's going to spit out a range of colors from that, those extreme numbers. I don't know, I always want to do this. Uh, if I'm doing multiple runs, I just want to set these two numbers manually. Otherwise, my scale is going to change between runs. Does that make sense to everybody? It's relative because um, the red is going to mean one thing for one run and another thing for the other run because the extremes are going to change. Um, so for this, it's it's just easy, so I don't do it. But um, just be careful when you're doing comparative runs. What you want to do is look at these numbers and then set them manually to, like, say, 150 and 600, so it's constant. And red always means the same thing, and blue always means the same thing. Okay, um, so we've got that part of this. Let's create a mesh. So we need to deconstruct the mesh. Deconstruct the mesh, and we're going to deconstruct the mesh. Construct the mesh, yeah. Okay, so take your we started with, the one that came out of the little blue and green. And you break it down into vertices, faces, and all the those things are. And then you reload it. I don't know why. It's like, there's got to be a better way to do this. This is the way I do it. Um, and then this time you add a color. So basically you take the mesh, take it apart, and then you rebuild it again, but this time with a color associated with the mesh. And that color comes from uh, here. So, we run this value into here. So what that's doing is it's taking those radiation values. <laughs> 540, right? It runs 540 into this gradient thing. It says, oh, 540 is this far between blue and red. So 540 produces uh, that color, that cyan color right there. Okay, so I'm, quite, I'm putting out cyan for 562. For 560, you know, something down here, I'm 191, I'm putting out this color. So what I have down here right now is a list of colors. That list of colors matches my list of faces going in. So I should just be able to do like that, and I have my colors. I 
Yeah. Um, I just want to check something because last time I got reversed. Um, Okay. Uh, I don't know why I forgot to tell you guys, but North is always up in Diva. <laughs> That's pretty important. Um, you can't change north, so change your model. Uh, if your model is not pointed north, you got to rotate it to north. If you was always going to assume your north is, is up in your class. Um, and so I do have the colors correct. You see that north is blue. And we've got east, and we've got south, which is a little bit darker, and we've got west, which is a little bit better again. Yeah. So everything's working great. Uh, does anyone have any questions so far? We're about to get to the top of this one. Nope. Okay. So um, basically, I can take this number still all the way, you know, all the way back to the beginning, and go back to my parallel gram number and enter say, 50. And tweak my shape, and then rerun Galapagos. Or sorry, rerun Diva. Uh, yeah, run. Okay. Uh, and get my results, and then compare those two to each other. And that would take forever. I would just be sitting here all day long, and maybe there's like five or six options I'm interested in. And so I'll just do that. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but you could automate this whole thing. You basically took all, take all the sliders and let Diva or let Galapagos test all of those options for you, and then have the range of what those options were, the results at the end of the day. That's what we're doing. Okay, so we're getting to the Galapagos part. 437, and we've got time. Um, so I'll do this over again too. Here's how Galapagos works. It basically has two inputs um, or outputs. I don't really know what you call those. They're not really either. Um, it has two parts. It has the genome and it has the fitness. Okay, the genome are the variables. They are the variables in your equation. They're the length, the parallelogram, and all that stuff. That's all going to go into genome. The fitness is a number you define. That's the target. So our goal for this one is what? Low, so are you, low number, low number, right? So we want to get low numbers uh, that matter. Okay. So um, are you guys okay? Yeah. Let's just do this. Let's just do this as well. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say.
Um, someone in our office whose job it is to do Grasshopper all day long wrote this really handy Phoenix mirror thing. Um, so we'll use it. So I'm going from feet to square meters, and the area is right there, right? Because that's, remember this is my panel, and that's the area of the panel. So I need to multiply, I need to get the area of my panel. Now I've got my area of my panel in square meters coming out here, and I need to multiply the number of the solar radiation by that number, and that will give me the amount of energy on the surface. Multiplication. There's the area. There is the solar radiation, and you can see I've got 469 values, and it matches 469 values. So I'm good. My data matches, and that number right there is the solar radiation on each panel, right? So, so what's my score? <coughs> what's my score for Galapagos? Anyone want to guess? mass addition. It's all the panels added up, so all my totals, all my areas, all the panels added up, so um, mass addition. Running that in here, and that right there is the score. Oh yeah, so why did that happen? There you go, I got it. So I need to flatten right here. There it is. That's the number. So that goes into Galapagos. That's how I rank my results. That's the fitness. That's the fitness. Okay, and the other thing is I need to tell Galapagos that it's minimizing, not maximizing. It wants the lowest number, not the highest number. Right, otherwise, it's going to give you the worst possible scenario. So, you don't want to make that mistake. Just really fun to mess with that. Um, okay, one more part to this and we're done. So, genomes. Uh, so, you guys know what the genomes are? Yeah? Yeah. So, we're just going to run all those in.
uh, exactly how it works. So, um, popularly, I don't know what max tagging is. If anyone does, it's shout it out. I think it's when it stops. I've never seen a lot of people actually stop. Um, the population is 50. The population is how many iterations it does before it stops and analyzes the results. Okay? So, see how that number of initial boosts? That means that its first round of options is going to be 100. It's going to basically run through 100 random options, completely random options, and then it's going to take that 100 and look at the results and see which ones work the best. And then it's going to start picking directions and start optimizing it with like the right genomes. So, um, a lot of times you run into a problem where Galapagos hones in on an optimal solution too quickly. Like it just really loves this one thing and it just will not explore something way over here. You know, like a completely different scenario. The way to get over that is to make that first initial population much bigger. You go with 500 initial random options so that it has uh, a wider pool of genes to select from and then it's going to start exploring in a wider range of directions. That's the best way I can describe that. We're just going to leave all this stuff the way it is. Is a local maximum or a local minimum? What's that? It's like a local maximum or a local minimum? Um, like if you, you had a graph that would get stuck over here. Without looking at the whole yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and check out this, this visualization because um, it kind of explains it really well um, when it's running. I just want to make sure that we have it on the screen that we can see what's going on. Okay, there it is. Let's run it. By the way, I always use this evolutionary solver. I don't know what simulated mailing is. Um, I could have brought another guy who knows what that is, but I don't know what it is. And, I, and actually, um, Galapagos isn't the only one of these kind of tools either. Uh, there's one called Octopus, and there's another one called, I mean, it's probably some other animal name, I don't know. But it, um, there are different methods of doing these kind of, uh, this kind of problem solving. Uh, and I don't know that much about it, so I'm not going to talk about it. Okay, so I just started it, and as you can see, it sets the this, this sliders automatically, it runs Diva. Diva finds the, ants, the, the mass addition of all the solar radiation, and it gives, and I screwed something up already. Okay. It's actually not broken, it's working just fine. It's just that I forgot to tell you about these little dials up here on the right. Okay. Uh, these little dials on the right, are um, settings, visual settings. If you choose this one, it'll show you every single run as it's working. If you choose this one, it only shows you the best run, like the optimal one at the time. Um, I don't know what that one is. Do not display GMS in my view. So, okay, that turns it off. Um, so, now, I'll see what it's doing. It's going to run, like we said, it's going to run for 100 of these, and then you'll start to see some action in here. Uh, basically, there are graphics that show you how it's optimizing uh, towards a, uh, a more optimal solution. Um, if you guys want, we can take a quick break. Uh, otherwise, I can show you the end result of this, and you can go through it, and I can tell you like how what the Galapagos interface means, and then we're done. So, I just have a quick question. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on handling Three. all of the data that you don't use? It's being printed and it's coming to exist and you know, like the digital detritus, if you will. Just like delete it and ignore it? Because um, there's so much that's like happening. It's like doing really robust simulations throughout every little iteration. I, I think thousands that of them, it's know. okay to delete it. Yeah. Uh, as long as it's, if you think that you might need it, and um, keep it, but uh, don't. It's not that precious. Data is not precious. 
Yeah. It is like data doesn't. It, data is just like everywhere. People used to hoard data. I mean, think about it. Like going to the library was a big deal, and like people knowing stuff was a big deal. Now it's like you just look that up on Wikipedia. You know, it's lame to know stuff. Like it's easy. It's everywhere. It's, it's about parsing data and making data useful. That that's the valuable thing. I mean, I'll give you an anecdote, not an anecdote, but an actual story that happened to me. The first time I did this, I recorded everything. I recorded every single node in a text file, and I had it writing out text files. Um, and every single time, we would write that text file longer and longer. And I crashed our server at work because it was writing that file over and over and over again. It got bigger. And yeah, and everyone was mad at me. <laughs> so, yeah. You know. So, this will happen a hundred times before we see anything. So I can show you. There is a question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What the value is in capturing iterations that show how you get to final solution. The optimal. Yeah. It's, the the yeah, it's the trending. It's the trending. It's the trending. It's the trending. Uh, I think that seeing the optimal solution actually isn't that valuable, always, because yeah. uh, you don't know how it got there, and you don't know where it was narrowing things down to. Um, actually seeing things like one after another after another, uh, that informs you that it goes, okay, if the building starts to lean out to the left side or the west side, it's self-shading, that's where I want to put either some horizontal sun shades or I want to actually shade my building that way. You know, so that's informing you as a designer. Uh, because you don't want your left goes designing your building for you. You design it. Before you show it in Photoshop, are you layered? A lot of the results. Yeah. Have you developed a method for keeping that kind of that progression? Yeah. Of better and better examples yeah. to make it so that you can kind of see the I haven't. I mean, that's kind of what I'm I'm working on is is trying to do that. I don't like I mean the videos that we're doing. Yeah. That's the best way method so far, um, and that takes a video. So if I can do that in a still frame that communicates, I think that would be awesome. I don't know, hopefully, I'll figure out something to do. It's easy. Each one is a determined then by a set of data, so if you can find a way to sort that list, like you sort other lists, yeah. we potentially like catalog about how good each one of those different generations become. Yeah. I don't know if you noticed, but the one I showed you, uh, the Boston one, mm -hmm. had a chart in the background, it was kind of going like this in yeah. the background. That's because that's when I recorded the data, like you're saying, and then I had the chart, so it was showing you oh, which run, and it was showing you where it was in comparison to the best and the worst one. Mm -hmm. Um, but you don't want to do that. Recording this stuff is just a pain. Yeah. It's actually the best way to capture it, if you're interested in capturing it, is to snag it. You have to snag it? Yeah, it's great. It has a time to capture, and it'll delete any duplicates. So you just time and capture it, be like every two seconds. And, um, you know, it's super easy. Yeah. And it took us a surprisingly long time to figure that out. We did other very gainful methods. So,
consultant. It's not integrated in the process. Uh, so knowing it up front, because the, the decisions get made now further and further up front. I mean, I've seen projects where pretty much they get designed uh, during the proposal phase, during the like, not even SD, during the like negotiation with your architect phase. You know, like the handshake, lunchtime. But we're actually doing the design, and that that, that happens. So, so um, um, the only way to, to actually make this stuff useful, to do this kind of analysis and have it inform your work, is to have it be this easy. To have it be this fast and easy. You can plug this in. And so, like, maybe you get a call and you go, okay, I've got a project, X minus square feet, this is the location. I can run this, and the next time I have a conversation with that person, I can, I can make informed decisions. So. Anybody else? What are some, uh, some good resources that you found for researching these concepts? I just mentioned perhaps on the web. I don't know if there's a question. Yeah, because I actually don't. I don't see a lot of the research. Um, I, uh, I'm the Grasshopper Forum. That's a bad newsletter. You get a plugin that sounds interesting. Test it out. This is like a lot of us. I'll give you I'll give you a good resource for uh energy information. Um, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Oh, you know. Uh, you haven't heard of them. They are they're pretty much the only people you can trust in this stuff. Uh, like people are spinning out data left and right, like we said. And most of it is totally meaningless. I mean uh, it's just garbage. It's like, oh we used Ecotech and we made all this stuff, and it looks like we're scientists, but we're not. Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory is actually scientists that are doing experiments with comparing physically built spaces with virtually simulated ones and doing post-analysis. Um, they are also the most sophisticated in terms of presenting uh, the arguments when it comes to uh, justifying cost, first cost in buildings. Uh, so conversation that we have a lot is, why should I spend X amount of dollars on this fancy skin you're giving me? It doesn't pay for itself. And you're saying, and you say, well, it does pay for itself. You're just not factoring in all the stuff. And they're saying, no, I factored in everything. I factored in daylight. I factored in solar radiation. It still doesn't pay for itself. And in the case of CJ, they would actually be right. It still doesn't pay for it. Actually, I think the power company would have to pay them every year for like five years to pay for that skin system. Um, but what they're not factoring in is the behavioral stuff. It's occupant comfort. It's sick days. And if you look at their resources, their architectural investment compared to their employee investment is like tiny. Now, most of their money goes to their employees and their talent. And that attitude is, you know, in the US we have that attitude too, especially with my software engineers, it's like all about getting the talent. It's such a big deal now. So if you can make the argument based on occupant comfort, uh, if you say, you know, like this kind of space has 20% uh, less sick days for employees because they're more happy in their space, then you've got a really strong argument because there's dollars attached to that. And, and that's, they're the ones that are making that case. That's the person that they're making that case. Are there people you know of that are collecting that data? Those guys. The ones that are the national laboratories. They're the only ones you can trust. There might be people that say they're collecting that data. I mean, especially if they're architects. Never trust the architects. <laughs> <laughs> engineers, you can trust. Uh, you can trust some engineers like Eric and stuff. But I mean, the thing is that um, I guess I'm wondering how widely that information is available now. Like, are you able to go to a client and actually give solid information, or is it more kind of trends? Uh, you think it's going to be I've been looking for it. You know, because that those are the kind of pieces of, of the little slides that you have that say, you know, here's why you want to do this. Right. Um, I, I keep hearing about it, and people keep saying, oh, I'm going to send this to you, but I haven't seen it myself. I haven't seen anything that convincing yeah. um, that's actual, um, researched, you right. know, trustworthy sources that show. But there, people keep telling me that there are, that these things exist. That there are studies that say that people that are comfortable in this last days at work, and um, I, maybe I just haven't. I guess I was even thinking, okay, we built a building this way, now let's look at the data for where there are people you know, taking less sick days in that building. Like yeah. Actually getting down to... The post occupancy. Yeah. yeah. And if you, fewer people do that, you'd be so surprised how many architects don't do the post occupancy analysis. Or sell that as an answer. Um, you think you'd be in your own interest, but you know, 
we love designing. We want to go off and do the next big project and, and not to forget about the old ones. Um, but uh, like the best one that I know of is the New York Times building. And the one in, in, that one has really good post occupancy information. They both um, they modeled it. We did a, a computer model of it. Uh, some poor guy actually modeled it in radiance. Um, and then they built a mock-up of it, a full-scale one-floor mock-up of it, uh, and then they have the actual building that they used to test it. So they, they validated the results. So that's that's a great resource for, uh, not for the grasshopper stuff, but for the environmental stuff. Somewhere here, I have this already imported with the colors mixed up and backwards. represent the genomes. See how far apart they are? That means it's trying furthest out on each slider, right? So think of each one of those, these points as your sliders. And these are, it's just trying all kinds of random stuff, right? It's not honing in on any one thing. It's all over the place. Um, watch it as it goes on. Right, so now it's in an optimized solution. So this last generation, and remember generations are 50, 50 iterations a piece. This last generation, it didn't vary very much. It pretty much only tried little tiny variations because it knows it's getting close to the right one. And then you know, we talked about the, the population becoming too centric to one solution. That's this chart right here. So you'll see when it has two potential options to explore, you'll see two clusters, like the little circles of focused in on some clusters. Um, and that happens sometimes depending on what your conditions are. Like you get to the like right there. So right there, it's, it's basically going in two different directions. It's got two combinations of those sliders that it likes. And then it, it figures out that one of them is better than the other and everything mutates in that direction. And it spends most of the time at the end just like um, fine tuning, um, fine tuning that. So these are the successive generations, each one of these bars. Um, that says 80, I think, so with 80 batches of 50. And every batch of 58 hones in, hones in, hones in, hones in. So um, each one of these points is when it's improved the best, it finds a new best option. Uh, and then these things are your genomes. They represent like every single run it's done. Uh, it's like it's supposed to be like a genome. You know, yeah. kind of and then um, you can click on that and uh, re-instantiate that option. So if there's one, you can go back like a generation here and say, oh, this is interesting when it was going into different directions. And this is what we're talking about with the trending. You can use this to sort of think about trending. You can say, oh, look. Once this is done, at the end of the analysis, you can play with this box and you can look through your generations. So you can say, okay, if I go back to, sorry to do the static here. Um, okay, if I go back to right there, I'm interested in what the two, the variations are between these two peaks, right? I'm gonna go back and find those genes and re-instantiate those and take a look at those options to compare it. And maybe that informs me. Or maybe it doesn't. Alright, so now it's up to you guys to just find like more interesting stuff to look at besides solar radiation. <laughs> I'm so bored of solar radiation. <laughs> I didn't show you guys, but it's like one of the smallest overall energy uses in a building. Yeah. And it's funny because I mean every single uh, environmental analysis you see of a building, less now, but like within like the it's sort of changing over the last year, but everyone does a solar radiation analysis because it's like it's the low hanging fruit of, of environmental analysis. It's really easy to get. 
Uh, but if you look at a breakdown of energy use in a building, like an office building in Los Angeles, almost half is the light. Has nothing to do with the cooling. The cooling is like 10% or something like that. So you're going after 10% of the pie, which is like, you know, who cares? So it's not that big a deal. Like you, you spend all this time and energy, it's really just okay, you know, we figured out a way to justify like, some really cool shading devices. But the reality is you should be going after the daylight anymore, because that's where the real energy settings are. Um, go after the views. Like open up the, the, the developer's business model and see if there's something you can get from that spreadsheet to drive this, to optimize for whatever that is that's affecting the performance. You know, like that, all that stuff is way more interesting than this. I'm going to use this for like carbon under design. There's like 30 of them. Yeah, there's a class happening right now for carbon places. Yeah. Well, that's interesting.